Hello, everyone. All right, let me start. So uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you for uh, joining uh, my session on Philfast IoT. Uh, my name is Pete, and I work at a company called uh, Luminous. That's me on the uh, fruit table at the office. Um, I'm a cloud consultant and a senior software engineer. Um, and I recently wrote a white paper on cloud migrations. Um, and today I'm going to talk about uh, partly about clouds, but also about IoT, a combination of both. So um, the outline of the talk today. Uh, first, I'm going to explain what fill fast IoT means and what it is and what it isn't. And then I'm going to talk a little about uh, failing. So what failing means in the context of fill fast IoT. Uh, then what it means to be fast and then something on cloud IoT. So the combination of IoT and cloud. And then we're gonna put it all together and show you a demo from a project we did using this process. So this is gonna take 35 minutes and at the end we have a Q&A session of about 10 minutes. All right, so what is fill fast IoT? It's a process, a way to produce uh, an IoT and software project, but it's also a philosophy. It's a way of thinking about cloud and IoT and a combination of both. So how you can be productive using the cloud and using devices, connected devices. So we didn't just think of this for fun, that we had a problem to solve. And the problem was that hardware development, in our opinion, is sometimes uh, really slow or rather slow. It's uh, gaining traction these days, of course, but for us uh, engineers that do both hardware and software, we wanted to come up with a way to uh, test our uh, products faster. Uh, there's also a disconnect sometimes between hardware people and software people. Um, but we think that uh, the advent of the cloud and IoT should be able to bridge uh, this gap. Uh, of course, you still have hardware people and software people, and you will always uh, have them. But I think uh, this process should be able to close the gap, at least. Uh, what we also saw in a couple of projects we did that uh, testing was mostly done at the end, because hardware has to be developed, has to be productized and then at the end sometimes we were asked to do the software part for example the cloud part or the server side and that didn't fit really well and that slowed projects down uh, so what you got was waterfall like projects with a lot of risk building up and then at the end a big bang and then the test of it actually worked as expected so we tried to make a process that was more agile than that and less expensive. Okay, so for whom is this? So who is going to be able to use this process? Obviously it's for the R&D department because they wanna do quick iterations of testing. Um, it's for software people that have hardware ambitions. So for example, if you're a programmer, but you also like to tinker with uh, Arduino stuff or uh, your, uh, your, your soldering uh, device or vice versa because what hardware doesn't have software these days, right? And also for the curious. So if you're curious about this, then you're welcome to join. Okay, so the first part of fail fast IoT is the failing part. Failing has value because if you fail, you know what you are not supposed to do in a project, uh, which gives you a, uh, a different perspective on the, on the future of the project. If you fail, you also know that you have to avoid something in the future. And failure is something very intuitive to people. Uh, projects, groups, people intuitively know when something has failed, even if it's hard to express in words. So that makes failing learning, uh, but in a negative connotation. It also forces you to think from a customer perspective, because if you think about uh, the customer that's using your product, then you will know if you feel faster than if you only think about it from the software or hardware or technical side, because you can do a great project, but launch a failed product. 
Another way to look at this is in the uh, perspective of a job to be done. So if you're a customer, you're not buying trunks and uh, bolts and a board with sandpaper on it and some uh, screws. What you are buying is the ability to do this. So if you're a customer, if you're a client, you don't buy parts or technique, you buy something that will be able to change your life, to make you a better or different you. That's a job to be done. So keep that in mind. So one of the ways to do this process is to fill till you make it. So for example, you know you're here and you wanna end up here. So you're uh, at the present and you wanna end up in the future where you have launched a product for customers. You know that the fastest way is a, a straight line and there's some island in the middle, so you have to go around it, but it looks fairly straightforward. But once you start your journey, you'll encounter something. In this case, a sea monster, but it could be a, uh, an impossibility uh, at the hardware uh, department, or maybe something isn't as easy as you thought it would be, or something is straight up impossible. So you have to go around that. So you try to go to the uh, endpoint again, and then you hit the iceberg in this case. So the metaphorical iceberg is uh, another failure. Doesn't stop you from reaching your goal, but right before you are there, you encounter another impossibility. You go around it and then you'll get to your finish. So the point from uh, start to finish, from idea to project is never a straight line, as you probably all know. Uh, it is always a zigzag line, but the point on the horizon stays the same. It could also change. Maybe you decided to opt for the island in the middle of the sea because it's nice there anyway, or maybe you should go more inland because at the sea there are rough edges. edges. Okay, the problem is that humans suck at failing because failing itself, the term sounds negative. Uh, you, you're, I don't know a lot of people um, that are uh, confident in telling me they failed. So this is implicitly discouraged by many people and companies. So you are told to not fail implicitly. There's also the sunk cost fallacy. So you're doing a project, you've already spent a lot of money on it and nobody is going to pull the plug because, well, you have already spent so much money on it, right? It's a sunk cost fallacy and it's hard to pull the plug on this and take your losses. You, if you stop now, you've only wasted that amount of money you've already put in. If you stop in a year, you've wasted that plus that next amount of money. But that's hard. So uh, we took a lesson from the book of Lean Manufacturing. Lean Manufacturing says you have to build and you have to build quickly, then experiment with your build. And the experiment is uh, putting the thing into user's hands. And if the user has it, then you can measure if it does what you expected it to do. Mm -hmm. So you get data, for example, does the user do what we thought he would do? Can he succeed in their job to be done? Can he do what we expected him to do or her? You learn from this and then you improve your ideas. So the failing part, is disguised as learning, as I told before. So failing is learning in this case. So you have to fail and then you can go into a new direction. So that doesn't mean your whole project has failed. It just means some part of it has failed. And then what? Well, congratulations, of course, because by now we know that failure is a good thing. You didn't fail everything, you just failed something. But you have to think about, about the thing I just talked about what is it that failed and what didn't fail. And then for your next iteration, you're going to have to try to avoid what you just did that made it fail. <clears throat> and then you'll do it again, but slightly differently. And then you fail again and again. And this metaphor I like, if you think about success, you mostly think about a, uh, a point from A to Z with a straight line between A and Z. And that's it, you're just going to go there, just like in the map example I gave before, but it's never like this. Successful people know this. You're always failing along the way. Sometimes you have to return, sometimes you have to take a detour, 
But in the end, if there is success, the road looks like the road on the right hand side. So you have to fill again and again until you succeed or until you feel so, so miserably that you can't succeed the project, which is fine as well. Remember the sunk cost fallacy. So that was the fill part of fill fast IoT, now the fast part. So why fast? Why the emphasis on, on speed? Well, first of all, um, time is money, of course. So you're going to work with people on a project and people cost money. So every minute you spend on a project with a team is going to cost money. Also, uh, the world around you doesn't stand still. You're always uh, moving along with the world. So if you have an idea last year and you take two years to implement it, then your the world you've imagined might be completely different depending on the project you do. <clears throat> so if you're fast, you prevent the world from moving too much, from changing too much. So you, you get agile. Your competitors do the same. They're also not standing still. So if you're going fast, um, in this case, in this philosophy, that means that you're learning something. Because to go fast, take a supercar, for example, you have three types of people that you can give a supercar. The first one jumps in and goes 30 miles an hour because he doesn't dare to go faster. The second type of people go so fast, they crash into the first wall they encounter. And the third type starts slow and goes faster and faster until they've reached the limit of the car. And thereby, by trying to go faster, you are reducing risk because you're um, not building up risk that has to be released or maybe it, your project failed at the end of the project. So Mark Schwartz, an author that does a lot of talks about, on this principle, says failing fast doesn't mean fail. <clears throat> like I said before, it means to provide an idea, a validity of an idea. Before you invest money into, the, into it. So if you're going fast, it means you can also quickly determine if your idea was any good. So then you can make small investments and pull the plug at any time instead of making a huge investment and then fail at the end, like a lot of government projects tend to do. Mark is also ex-government, so he knows what he's talking about. <clears throat> so about what I said about risk buildup, if you do a waterfall-like project, you invest a lot of money and you're not sure if that money is well spent until you release the project. In a waterfall-like fashion, that takes a long time. So your money is at risk right until you re release it. And then you know for sure if it was a worthy investment. So if you shorten those iterations, you can keep the rest of your money, reduce the risk for the time being, and then try to determine if your investment was worth it and if you would want to continue. And if you do even shorter iterations, like in the DevOps principles, you reduce risk even more. So how do you become fast? You cannot just say to a team of people, okay, now go and be fast. You have to get out of their way. So you have to reduce process. You have to trust them uh, that they do what they know is best. You have to hire excellent people like Netflix does, they have this new book out, uh, No Rules Rules. And the idea behind their, uh, their people strategy is you have to hire excellent people, be very honest about, it, about what they do, give them a lot of feedback, and then remove controls. So remove process, remove rules, make sure that the excellent people are trusted to do what they know is best for your company. And you have to do a lot of iterations. Like I said, in lean manufacturing, building in this case means code and hardware. Measuring gives you data, which gives you something to learn about and then do it all over again, but slightly different. And going faster means minimizing this loop. So you, you'll start off rather slow and then you'll go faster over time. Okay, now the last part of fill fast IoT, the IoT part. 
<clears throat> and more specifically the cloud IoT part. So uh, looking at the state of DevOps, the power of the cloud um, is measured there. There are some elite um, companies and some low performers. The elite use uh, the cloud 24 times as uh, are more are 24 times as likely to use the cloud than the low performers. And the difference between these two types of companies is huge. So the elite performers that use cloud a lot can deploy on demand, while the low performers can deploy once, twice a year. The elite takes less than a day to go from a idea to production, where others, the low performers, can go anywhere from 12 to two times a year to do changes. If something goes wrong in production, the elite takes less than an hour to fix it, while the low performers can take weeks. And the elite also make less mistakes than the low performers. So this means that if you have low cycle times, low restore times, and low failure rate, you're going to go much faster in getting a good idea or a better product in production. So you are improving constantly. This is what they call a, an innovation flywheel at Amazon, for example. Other benefits, like I said, 24 times as likely to use cloud than the low performance the elites. You can do better cost estimates and identification so you can identify the costly parts of your system more easily in the cloud. You're more likely to stay below budget because you are so enabled to monitor your costs and to uh, to change what your what the cost is because you have a offer you don't have uh, capital expenses anymore only operational expenses and your employees will be, be more satisfied and thus less likely to be sick so just to drive home this point about cloud this image you probably all know um, so on the left side is your data center on the right side is uh, the serverless world so in a data center, you manage everything, which costs you a lot of time and money. In the cloud, depending on the uh, deployment type you choose, um, you can manage anything from containers to nothing, just the code, which you can also scale. So you have to think about scale still, but all the rest is abstracted away by the cloud. So in our case, in Philfast IoT, We've chosen to do as much serverless as we can, just to make sure we spend our time doing something that has a functional impact and is not wasted away on the infrastructure level. And the modern cloud, so AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, has a lot of services, managed services, and other uh, stuff like uh, IoT operating systems that enable you to do exactly what I just sketched. So free Artos, for example, is an operating system for microcontrollers, uh, for uh, uh, node MCUs, for example, or uh, Arduino-like devices that enable you to connect to the cloud with really very little investment. And Azure has a similar uh, business um, scheme. So they have a lot of measured, uh, I mean, uh, managed uh, IoT services that you can use to get into the cloud with your devices quickly. So once you're in the cloud, the sky is the limit. Again, this is to make sure you can put all your time into doing what the customer wants. So what, so you can enable them to do their job to be done, to be a better person. So you're not interested, interested in the bolts and screws in a technique. You're interested in building what a customer can use to improve their lives. So if we put all of this together, we have the lean manufacturing validated learning cycle, the accelerated innovation with an excellent team. And we can do this because we have the cloud. So we can do fill fast IoT. This is a logo we used internally to promote the process and to try it out. Okay, so now something uh, from our practice. So what we did was um, do some sort of idea competition 
and ask people to uh, send in ideas to test out this process. The winning idea was a sort of beer distribution game, but with coffee. And a beer distribution game, for those who don't know it, is something like this. You have a customer that drinks the beer or the coffee. And on the other side, you have a manufacturer that produces the beans. And in between, you have uh, people that uh, package the coffee and bring them to cafes or to supermarkets. Um, and you have all sorts of in-between notes in the uh, whole uh, road from manufacturer to customer. So what it looks like is you have a customer that has a demand for quantity. So a retailer has to uh, have more in stock than a customer asks for to prevent the customer for going for a cup of coffee and getting sold nothing. That's what, what you wouldn't want as a retailer because that means you will drive the customers away. So your, your stock is always bigger than the demand of the customer. The same goes for the wholesaler that uh, sells to the retailer. They can't sell no, because that means the retailer will go to another wholesaler. So they have um, stock that is bigger than the retailer's requirements. The same goes for a manufacturer and for a supplier. So down the chain, you get a sort of bullwhip effect. So once the customer's demand increases, that means down the chain to the supplier, the demand increases sometimes manifold. So you want to try to uh, compress this bullwhip as much as possible. The most lean way to do this would be that the supplier supplies exactly as much coffee as the customer would want at any moment at the same rate. If the customer wants more, then the supplier has to make exactly that much more. The rest is waste. And in the case of coffee, this isn't so bad because well, coffee doesn't spill that easily. But uh, if you're producing bread, for example, or cookies or something other that some other thing that spoils or cars that are very expensive to not drive, uh, to keep, then you would want to be as lean as possible on the supply side. So again, we followed the process, but instead of learn, we put in fail. And we went to work. We got a few people together that wanted to try out this process. These are those people. This is our office. And we got a team of people that were multi-talented, T-shaped, that had broad interest, but deep experience, deep knowledge. And in this case, uh, Ivo and Anne, they are UX UI designers. That's their expertise. Silvan and I did some front-end technology. And Rashid Auke and I did some back-end technology. Rashid also did the hardware and Ivo too. So, uh, multiple disciplines, uh, sometimes shared by the same people. So this is what we needed to try out our process. So we went into iteration one. So we started up our supercar, produced a logo and tried to drive around the track slowly to see where the limits were, where the pain points were. So we uh, imagined a uh, supply chain on the left side is the producer. On the right side, we have three consumers. And in the middle, there's a distributor. And our designers came up with this, some sort of interface where the producer delivers to the distributor, which delivers to three dealers. And the dealers deliver to clients. Here's a uh, interface. On the top right side, you can see a uh, visualization of the um, demand and a sort of client in the middle. And at the bottom is our um, concept of the hardware. So you have a producer that has a button with which you can speed up production or slow down. Uh, you have a maintenance button at the top left, at the bottom left. And um, you have two buttons that indicate if something is going wrong. So if the producer is going to have to uh, maintain their machines or fix them. Then we did design on the whiteboard. And then we went to work. So this is our first uh, hardware uh, iteration. So the, the button to speed up production is on the left. We have the, the lights that indicate failure or maintenance uh, need. And we have a 
button that repairs the machine, the blue one. And what you see on the top right is a Note MCU, a uh, connected microcontroller, a Wi-Fi connected microcontroller. So then we made a client and the client connected to a API and the API was connected or the, the controller, the hardware was also connected to the cloud and it started producing. And uh, this was our, the result of our first iteration. And, and I, what I'm hoping now is that you are looking at this and thinking, what the hell am I looking at? I, I can't see how this is a solution for your problem. And that's exactly what we got from our clients. So our clients were people internally to our company that tried this out. And they said, we don't get this. What, what does the hardware do? What's, what's with those people on the screen? Why, why is there no score? How does this work? So we filled already, which was great in our case, because that was, that's what we wanted. So we went back to the drawing board for iteration two. And the most feedback we got on the client, obviously. So that's where we focused our attention because that's where the most pain was. So still the same logo, the same people back to the drawing board. And then we designed uh, the backend a little more event-based to prepare our client to do the things we wanted to do. I'm not going to explain all the details on this, but what you see on the left side is the hardware connected to AWS IoT core. It produces um, beans in our case. And at the end here is a client that can see if something is produced and the client emulates uh, customers coming into a store getting coffee. I don't know if you can hear this, but we also made uh, music for the game and some sounds. So the feedback we got, well, okay. So there's a score. Like you see here, we get the uh, minus points. Um, so we get you, you can have uh, minus and plus points. The sounds are nice, they indicate something. We don't know what. And this also so ah, so you can you can also go game over. So we're game over now. But why? Well, we still don't get why this is a solution for this bullwhip problem. So we went back to the drawing board. So we did a little better, but we still failed. Same people. And then we tried to make it a little more clear that people were actually picking up these products that we were manufacturing something and that there was a score and you had certain lives with five lives. So they say, oh, so it's a queue in a store. Right, right, we get it, we get it. Oh, and the, the customers, they get angry. So you have to uh, serve them in a timely fashion. So that's why there's a button that increases the speed of production. But you can also produce too much because if you produce too much, you get minus points. You, you lose lives. Um, but they still didn't get why those customers disappeared. Why, where did they go? It was confusing. But it was already much better than the first iteration. So we went back to the drawing board. We saw we filled still mostly at the client level. Um, but the hardware was also a little confusing. So we asked our uh, UXer, who is also a 3D hobby modeler, to create a factory uh, in which we could, do the, could house the microcontroller. And we uh, redesigned the event system because sometimes we got um, uh, events that crossed, so they weren't um, in order. And we redesigned the backend a little so we could produce this. Has more feedback for the user. They will, you can wait for a client, the hardware to connect and then start the game. Then you have to wait till the game's actually starting. And then you can tweak the hardware to produce and every time you produce the customer gets served and if you produce too much like in this case you have a backlog of production and if it, the backlog is too big if you produce more than three items you get uh you lose a life and it's more obvious now that customers are getting angry and why they are leaving the floor because they are getting served so the feedback we got yes this is much more clear we can now see who gets served and we understand the point system intuitively now and that there's a sort of time pressure in the game. But we are still not sure what happens with these angry customers and we, we can't see the hardware. 
So the last iteration we did was trying to come up with a way to show what the hardware did in the client, because by now we were in COVID times and it wasn't easy to get together and show the hardware uh, in real life, face to face. So we uh, designed something that could show if the hardware was uh, functioning properly. And we did some slight improvements to the client. Uh, you could see them getting angry more obviously now. Oh, let me skip ahead a little. Yeah, like this. So if a client is not served now, he gets agitated and eventually will disappear into a hole in the ground. And you can see that they literally make you lose a life. And we speed the music up Mario style at the end. So that's where we were at iteration five. So now we're in the middle of iteration six. We're producing the hardware and trying to come up with a way to show the factory state so that next time we can do something about um, predictive, predictive maintenance. Okay, I just want to go back to uh, the iteration one just to show you the difference between what we produced in iteration five and the last one. So this is our first iteration. And the last one looked much better already. Okay, so that was my presentation on Philfast IoT. And now we have time for uh, questions. Oh, Arne has a question. How long do the iterations take and how long to complete the process until six? So um, our iterations took about, uh, well, we, we did it in uh, on company time, but we didn't want to spend a lot of money doing this. So the iterations were really short. So in man hours, I think we did um, one day per iteration uh, times uh, six persons. And... Um, the last iteration was a little shorter. So a few, uh, a whole work day for each uh, iteration. Okay, maybe I, I can come up with my own questions because uh, while I was doing this, I was wondering um, if you wouldn't be agitated about not seeing a lot of hardware. Um, so what I already told uh, was we wanted to focus on the produce, on the client, uh, the, know the, the user of the system. And uh, the user was mainly exp uh, mainly experiencing pain on the client side of things and not on the hardware side. So we did a lot of software iterations uh, on, a, on an IoT project, which for me was quite interesting because I imagined it to be 50-50. Uh, but uh, the, the thing is, uh, the project is not that complicated hardware-wise, but IoT shouldn't be complicated hardware-wise either in our opinion. So that's why we focused on uh, the software side of things, because uh, at the cloud level, the sky is the limit. Okay, Henrik has a question. The problem was a supply chain problem. Not sure why you made the effort to visualize it. Um, so do you mean, uh, I'm not sure what you mean, Henrik. Um, why we didn't make an effort to visualize it or uh, Visualize the client. Why? Why we did that? So, um, well, I can I can say something about visualization. So, what we wanted was for the for a user of this system, uh, the the goal of the project was to um, get an intuitive sense of what predictive maintenance is. Maybe I should have been more clear about this, but the idea was to uh, put this in the hands of a client of ours, for example, and have them experience what it means if a uh, manufacturing machine breaks down and what that means, uh, what effect it has on the supply chain. So if you have to um, fix a broken machine, that will mean you have to slow down or stop production for a while. And that also means that uh, along the chain, you have to have enough um, stock to uh, be able to last uh, while the machine is being fixed. And what we wanted to do was uh, to visualize this broken machine or machine in need of reparation, and then uh, have the client progressively go from no predictive maintenance, so having to manually fix the machine, to predictive maintenance, where he, where he was uh, alerted of the fact that the machine was about to be 
uh, and need to be repaired. Then I'm going to close the, the session. Thanks everyone and uh, have fun at uh, JCon today.